Hey everybody, so I just got done editing this video you're about to watch and it's a little bit different from my normal style, but I hope you guys enjoy it. There is a lot of good information in there. For the sake of sanity, I am going to post a time code for where you can jump to the good parts of the video. I talk about cameras, lenses, tripods, gear, uh, gadgets, and trackers. So I'll put that down below if you want to jump to those parts, but if not, enjoy. So you want to get into astrophotography. You see your friends waking up at one in the morning, and heading outside to get frostbite and blurry pictures of the stars, and you think, yeah, that looks like fun, that's for me. Well, you're weird, you're a freak, you shouldn't be allowed to have a camera. But thankfully, I'm just as weird, so we can be weird together. Today we're gonna talk all about astrophotography, what equipment you need to get started, and this is for someone on a budget. This isn't for someone who has 15 grand to go and spend on the nicest, newest gear, but someone who just wants to get outside and enjoy the night sky and take some pictures of it. So let's go climb a mountain and talk about it. At this point in the video, I'm supposed to ask you to give it a thumbs up, even though I haven't actually delivered any content worth thumb upping yet. And I'm probably supposed to ask you to subscribe for more if you want to see more chaotic content like this walking through the woods. Oh, and you're also supposed to give the video a share or comment or something. Yeah. I'm sorry about voiceover guy. He eats Cheerios for breakfast and not even because he likes the taste. He actually thinks they're healthy. So talking about cameras, what you need to get a picture of the stars, it might not be as exciting as you're thinking. Something like a cell phone, like a modern smartphone has a good enough camera or even a GoPro, a cheap little action camera like this one can get you pictures of the stars. So if you just want to get out there and get started with something, don't hesitate to use these. You get, learn the pro mode on your camera, learn the right settings on your GoPro, and that will get you a nice picture of the night sky. Even a point and shoot like the Sony RX100 Mark VII, a little camera I have is definitely good enough to get pictures of the stars. So having the nicest camera is not the most important thing. Just getting out and using whatever you already have could be the best option. Now, if you are hooked and you wanna go full in and get a dedicated Astro camera, going to a full frame, either DSLR or mirrorless camera is the way to go. The larger sensor makes the camera more able to gather that limited amount of light you have at night. And it will do so with having less overall noise and grain as opposed to something like this or even an APS-C camera. So I use the Canon 6D Mark I, a really fairly old DSLR at this point, but it is great at taking pictures of the stars. You could also look at something like the Sony A7S II or something on the Nikon side of a D810 or a D750. All these cameras are a little bit older now, but for taking pictures of the night sky, they will do a great job. But say you wanna get a camera to do all kinds of photography. You wanna not just do it out in the stars, but you wanna take pictures of wildlife or travel pictures or family pictures. If you do want to save a little bit of money, you could go to a more modern APS-C camera. Something like the Canon D90 or the Nikon Z50 or a Sony A6600 or a Fuji X-T4 or X-T3. Even something like the Olympus that I'm shooting on with its Micro Four Loser third sensor with the proper techniques can get fantastic images of the stars. So whatever you have, whatever you use, the most important thing is your technique, but maybe the second most important thing is the lens. So let's keep on walking and we'll talk about that. Now, even if you do get the best camera possible, you still need to learn the proper technique for how to use it. And you need to learn things like the NPF rule or the rule of 500. You also should know whether or not your camera is ISO variant or invariant. You should also be able to get the best performance out of your lens by looking at the coma and seeing if you have to stop it down a click or two. 
Learning these different techniques will create much better pictures than just getting the very best camera. Like voiceover guy was just telling you, the most important thing you can get to help you with astrophotography is the proper technique and a little bit of education along the way. So because of this, I've teamed up with a buddy of mine, Justin, and we run workshops during the summer, either three or four night workshops. We have different levels for a completely beginner to more advanced, and we'll take you out into the field and work with you one-on-one -on -one to help you get the most out of the equipment that you've already invested in. But during the winter, it's, it's cold out and it's not as easy to do those in-person workshops. So I've decided to start offering one-on-one -on -one Zoom classes where we'll sit down on the computer for two hours and we can talk about anything you want astrophotography related. Any questions you have, any ideas you have. I think having someone to get their eyes on your images has helped me to improve my work and it's a great way that we can all learn together. So if you are interested in that, there are links down below for where you can sign up. Now talking about lenses, again, I'll go back to whatever lens, whatever camera you already have is probably good enough to start taking pictures. I shot this image here back in 2015 on a Canon Rebel T2i with their 18 to 55 kit lens. No, it's not the greatest picture, but it's good. And it got me excited to take more. So start with whatever you have. And when you're ready to invest into a dedicated astro lens, there's a couple really good affordable options that you can look at. I really recommend looking into the Rokinon or Samyang brands of lenses. They're for the most part manual focus, manual aperture, it doesn't actually talk to your camera, but the quality is very good. The lenses are sharp. And because they don't have so many extra features, you can get a nice 1.4 aperture for much, much less than say a Canon or Nikon or Sony prime lens. The two I recommend if you have a full fame camera is the Rokinon 14 millimeter 2.8 and the 24 millimeter f 1.4. I used the 24 to pretty much build my business. It was my first dedicated Astro lens and I loved it. So you definitely can't go wrong if you get a nice sharp version of this lens. Now, if you wanna go into a little bit more expensive, you could look at Sigma. Their art prime lenses like the Sigma 50, 35 and 85, and even the 20 are absolutely gorgeous. And they make them for almost every camera manufacturer out there. So definitely check out those Sigma lenses. If you're looking for a zoom lens with a constant aperture, I love Tamron for this. Their G2 lineup is great. I've owned three of their lenses, every single one of them I swear by. And this is a lens you can use for all types of photography. It has really good autofocus, nice and bright f2.8 apertures. You can use them for landscapes, weddings and events, family portraits, really anything you need those Tamron G2 lenses are great. We're gonna keep on walking now, and at our next step, we're gonna talk about possibly the easiest way that you can waste money while getting into astrophotography. He did mention that there were instructions for signing up for that workshop down below, but also there's some coupon codes. So you can use these codes to pay either 10% off, 20% off, or 40% off of that final price for that two hour Zoom workshop. So what's the number one way I see people spend money that they might not have to for Astro? It's tripods. Now, don't get me wrong, tripods are important. I have a pretty nice one that I use, but if you're just starting off and if you don't have the budget for a nice big carbon fiber tripod, you don't need to spend that much money because what does a tripod do? All of its functionality for Astro photography, what does your tripod do? It, it holds your camera still. What tripod can't hold your camera still? Sure, some of them might have more shake in the wind or any whatever like that, but for the most part, they're all the same. The difference between a $20 tripod and a $1,000 tripod for simple astrophotography, it doesn't quite make sense. So I got started with a cheap plastic Walmart tripod. It worked perfectly fine. At some point I saw where I could upgrade and I did so, but I didn't upgrade to the nicest tripod right away. I got one used off of Facebook and that worked just fine for many years. So 
If you can't afford a really nice tripod, that does not limit you. You can still get your proper camera, your proper lens, and get out and take pictures of the stars. So don't worry too much about that. But when you are looking to upgrade, there's a few things that I like to always look for in a good tripod. One is a ball head, the little beely on top that has those two knobs. That is super helpful because you can set it up, loosen those knobs, and point your camera anywhere you need to, tighten those knobs, and it's set. So you don't have to worry about it leaning or tilting or anything like that. The next thing I always like to look for is lightness. I don't want a big, heavy, huge tripod because so many times I'm hiking out into the mountains like this to get the pictures that I need. Because I need to get away from the town and away from the road, I want something nice and light and sturdy, but light is important. If you can not afford to get those really nice carbon fiber tripods, go for it. But if you can't, the aluminum ones that are nice and compactable, ones that are designed for travel that could fit on a backpack to take on the airplane, those are super nice. So down below, I've posted some links for the tripods I use, but honestly, most every tripod manufacturer is going to be good. I use a Manfrotto, but I've also used a Promaster, I've used a Silk. A lot of the different tripod manufacturers will make a good, light, but sturdy tripod that's just perfect for astrophotography. So when you're ready to invest, there's lots of options. But again, don't feel like you need the best tripod to get great pictures of the stars. To drive this tripod point home, here are some of the tripods I used to make this video. So now we got our basic kit pretty much set up. We got our camera, our lens, our tripod. Now let's talk about a couple other gadgets that could be really helpful for your astrophotography. The first one is an intervalometer. It's a remote that is connected either wirelessly or by a cable to your camera. And this can be used to start your exposure without you actually having to touch the camera, which can introduce a little bit of camera shake with that button push. The intervalometer can also be programmed to fire off shots sequentially in an order. And this can be really nice for doing time lapses or if you're taking multiple exposures to stack for noise reduction. Another thing that you can use on most modern cameras is the cell phone app. I don't love the apps on any of the cameras I have. Sometimes they work perfectly. Sometimes you're just fiddling with them. You can't get them to sync. They're really glitchy. And a lot of them have like a three star rating on the Play Store. How many of us get apps if they have a three star rating? So I don't like to rely on those cell phone apps, but I have used them when I forgot my intervalometer in the past. And they can be useful for avoiding that camera shake when you push the shutter button. But there's actually another trick that works no matter what camera you're using and you don't need any sort of device or app to avoid that camera shake. If you wanna learn that trick and many, many more that I don't have time to talk about in this video, sign up for that workshop or the one-on-one -on -one mentoring and I'll walk you through all kinds of different things that can be used to avoid camera shake. Another thing you'll need to pick up is a good headlamp. And by good, I don't mean expensive. There's tons of different brands out there that make headlamps. And I actually use a $20 one from Walmart or Lowe's. It's made by Energizer. It does everything I need it to. It has a red light and it has really dimmable settings. So you can make it to just a tiny bit of glow to illuminate the back of your camera. This is one way you can definitely save money. The more expensive headlamps have their perks. They're waterproof. They're, I don't know what else makes them better. I have a nice black diamond headlamp that I almost never use. I'm always grabbing those $20 Energizer headlamps. So that's one thing that you can definitely save money on. Something else you might want to pick up is a camp chair. Either those really tiny compactable tripod ones or a nice one that you would take like car camping to sit around the fire with. Generally, when you're out there taking photos, you're out there for an hour or two or three or four. So it always helps to be comfortable and those chairs can be really nice. And this might seem obvious, but I've made this mistake before. 
you want to have warm enough gear. In most parts of the world, it's pretty chilly in the middle of the night, even during the summer. So make sure you got a hat, jacket, pants, boots, whatever you need to stay warm. And one thing that I absolutely love are these little gloves from ProMaster. They have little pockets for your thumb and index finger that are magnetic. So you can just flip them open and they stay. That way, even when it's super cold out, you can work your camera with full functionality and then flip them back over and your hands will stay nice and warm. So those are just a few of the things that I really like, the extras that make astrophotography easier. If you have a suggestion for something, leave it in the comments down below and maybe it can help someone else out. We are up pretty much at the summit of this climb. So I'm gonna cruise on over and start dropping into the next valley. And when we get over there, we're gonna talk about something that I get asked about all the time by beginner astrophotographers. Should they pick up one of these? And for the most part, I always tell them no. So let's talk about that when we get oh, about a quarter mile over there. The house I grew up in is actually right at the base of this trail. And I looked at this power line road my whole life and for some reason never took the time to make the hike. So I'm sure glad that I did this time. It connects the Farmer's Corner area to my new house in Summit Cove. And it's a really cool hike. Now, the number one thing that I rec... Hmm, how's that for the audio? Now, the number one thing I recommend you do not buy when starting out with astrophotography is a tracker. That might seem counterintuitive because don't trackers allow you to photograph the stars for longer? Obviously, they would give you a higher quality photograph than like a 15 second exposure. It's super high ISO. While that's true, trackers also have a downside. When I was first starting off, I was just having fun. I was running around, playing with different compositions, playing with light painting, testing different lenses, see what I liked, see what worked, see what didn't. And this was really important. This was a really key part of the learning process for me. And once I kind of settled down and got a tracker, it went more from play to work. It wasn't running around and trying different compositions and weird stuff. No, it changes your mindset. You go from having fun to capturing data. Like here's this section of the sky. I want to image it for this long with this lens and these settings, set up everything, which can be a pain in the butt too, to actually get your tracker properly aligned and set my camera, get my intervalometer and go. So at that point, I'm sitting, standing, hanging out in the same spot for either a couple of minutes for one single tracked image, or if I'm stacking, I'm sitting there for an hour or two or three, just capturing either a panorama or one image of the night sky. So it definitely changes your shooting patterns. And on top of that, it's generally not necessary to use a tracker unless you're going for deep space or you're just trying to get the very, very best possible image quality. But to get to that point, you should have already mastered things like a simple single exposure, a stacked exposure, a time lapse, a panorama. You should know how to do expo exposure blending. You should be able to delete the sky out of a foreground and replace it with a different sky on, in Photoshop, all of these things are pretty much required skills in order to get the most out of your tracker. Sure, you can buy the tracker, point it at the stars, get the settings right and get an image. But if you're going to create a nightscape image where you have a beautiful foreground and then an epic track sky above you, it takes a lot of trial and error. So I think it's best for people to get really, really proficient without a tracker. And then once you do take that jump, you're gonna be ready. You're gonna know exactly how you want to use that tracker and how you're gonna post-process those images. So if any of you guys watching this right now are looking to get a tracker, but might be kind of intimidated by what I just said, don't be scared. There's plenty of free, helpful advice on YouTube, on the internet, and also I am including a tracking workshop in next year's series of workshops. So that's something that anyone is free to sign up for. We'll set up your tracker in person and get the most out of it. 
Or if you have a tracker and are just looking for a couple of tips, let's do that one-on-one -on -one Zoom call. And I'll work through any problems you might be having with you and we will make some beautiful images together. So I don't hate on trackers. I love trackers. I use trackers, but like I said, maybe not the best thing. So we're up at the top. We can see my house. Can I see my house? Yes, yes, I can see my house. It's down there. So awesome, we're gonna keep on walking and wrap things up down below. All right, everybody, looks like I've come to the end of my journey. I found the Swan Mountain bike path here, which leads straight back to my house. It was a really nice hike, but I didn't find one animal to photograph. That's why I brought that 40 to 150 lens on the Micro Four Thirds Olympus, trying to find some creatures, but no creatures were to be found. I do think I saw some coyote tracks, which are pretty cool. I know voiceover guy has already begged you to subscribe and comment and all of that, but as you guys watching this understand, YouTube works off of engagement. It helps me out with that algorithm. So please, if you did like this video, give it that thumbs up, comment your thoughts or maybe some specific gear questions. I always love going back and forth like that. And subscribe for more videos like this one. I'll be trying to come out with a new video about once a week throughout the winter. So stay tuned for that. And when the stars are out, I'll see you there.